working? The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, chapter 25, beginning at the 31st verse. Glory Glory to you, Lord Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous, or the just, or the upright, will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. In the name of our ever-living, ever-loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Well, there are lots of ways that we could go with this rather confusing reading, really. I'm going to try and keep it really simple this morning because I think at the heart of this passage, which the scholars may or may not call a parable, is a very simple message that hasn't changed. Looking after the person who is hungry thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick or in prison, showing care for the one who is the least and part of, Jesus says, part of the family, that is what the Son of Man will be interested in when he comes in glory. This is an apocalyptic passage from Matthew's Gospel. It's the last one. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about that language of eschatology or the end times. And this is one of those apocalyptic stories about what we might call the end times. And it's a passage that is, the scholars think is speaking not only to Matthew's Jewish community, but also talking about how the Gentiles will be included at the end times. What does this reading tell us about this figure that is called the Son of Man? Well, firstly, he has a throne. And the throne is described as the throne of his glory. And as I thought about what, I thought, what is the throne of his glory? The throne of his glory is that the the throne is part of this, the son of man's very being. That the glory that radiates and is part of the very essence of who the son of man becomes the throne. 
the Son of Man is a king. And he has the authority to share his kingdom with whomever he pleases. And it's sounding like it might be a fairly generous kingdom if we read the passage carefully. But this son of man, this king, is also like a shepherd of all things. A shepherd, the one who has authority over all things, is like a shepherd. Before we think more about what it means for this person to be the shepherd, let's just have a look at where this phrase, the son of man, comes from. It's drawn from another piece of apocalyptic literature, this time in the Old Testament, from Daniel chapter 7. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient One and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed." So what is this feast of Christ the King and why this reading? This reading that in the Revised Common Lectionary is set down to be read in churches in many different expressions all around the world today. The Feast of Christ the King, or as it was originally known, the Solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, we stick with the Feast of Christ the King, was introduced into the Christian calendar by Pope Pius XI in 1925, almost 100 years ago. So it's a fairly recent addition to the liturgical calendar. And consistent with today's reading, the Feast of Christ the King has an eschatological or a forward-looking dimension to it, looking forward to the end of time when the kingdom of Jesus the Christ will be established in all its fullness to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the universe. But so that it's helpful for us today, it also has a contemporary focus. You see, following World War I, there was growing despondency amongst people. There was a general disinterest in and rejection of Christianity, which seemed too romantic and idealistic in the face of the horrors of the First World War. But I think we can see parallels today, can't we? Amidst this turn to secularism, Pope Pius XI hoped that the feast would help faithful Christians to gain strength in their true King, Jesus Christ. The Pope hoped leaders and nations would recognize that they are bound to give respect to Christ the King. He hoped that nations would see that the church has the right to freedom. He hoped that individuals would honor Jesus Christ as their sovereign king and in their own lives embody Jesus' own self-giving embodied on the cross. Following their thorn-crowned king, individual people can help to bring love and care and relief to people who are suffering and in this way proclaim the reign of Christ in the world. Well, whether introducing this feast has been helpful in putting into action all those things that Pope Pius XI had hoped for is up to you to decide. But regardless, the church has observed this feast for the last hundred years in an increasingly secular world and perhaps does have something helpful for us to focus on today. This son of man, king of the universe, has power and authority over all nations, says our reading. However, this lord of the universe is not a remote imperial figure who exercises power over. 
This Lord of the universe is the compassionate, suffering Jesus. It's in coming alongside and exercising the power of love, in showing mercy and kindness that Jesus' reign is demonstrated in the world. So how do we reconcile the images that are presented in the story? Because they do come across as very black and white. When the reality of our world and the reality of the situations that confound us are often grey. Seldom do we encounter something that is clearly black and white, right or wrong. The distinction between the goats and the sheep was simply for the purpose of separating people into two groups. Neither sheep nor goats are ceremonially unclean, and often sheep and goats did graze together um, under the under the care of the shepherd. So there's nothing wrong innately with either, with the goats, even though they're chosen to represent those who are cast out. Let's turn for a moment to the shepherd imagery that is so prevalent throughout the scriptures. The psalm set for today in worship is Psalm 100, and we said that together at the 7.30 service, and it holds the imagery of God as shepherd. Psalm 23, perhaps the best-known psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then in Matthew chapter 9, there's this beautiful passage where Jesus has been healing and with the people, but he describes seeing the crowds as seeing sheep without a shepherd. And what was his response? He has compassion on them. And then in John, we encounter the imagery of Jesus as the good shepherd. And so in, on this feast of Christ the King, we also have this image of Christ as the shepherd, the compassionate, caring one with responsibility for the well-being of all those he loves. Compassionate care for those in need is at the very heart of discipleship. And so I wonder, because I think it is confronting, is it problematic for you that the king in the story doesn't separate the sheep from the goats by virtue of their profession of faith, by their church attendance, or even by their prayer life and their personal devotion and reading the scriptures. They are separated by virtue of their willingness or otherwise to serve others, to care for the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the one in prison. Undeniably, prayer, gathering for worship, and personal devotion are vital to our lives as Christians. But what is their role in this? It is to nourish us in our life with God so that we can be nourished for our work in the world and to bring about the Christian mission of building the kingdom of God in the world. The imagery in the story is metaphor. It's mystic, it's symbolic, and as I mentioned, it's, it's looking ahead to the end times. The application of metaphor is always limited. Metaphor always runs out in how far we can draw an analogy. The kingdom of God is deeply and profoundly about relationship. Always. There is nothing that happens within the kingdom of God that is not about relationship. All life in the kingdom is expressed through relationship with God, with others, and the relationship that we have with ourselves. When we share in the life of the Trinity, the very source of life, we are choosing to care for the needy. 
when we put our hand up to share in the life of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, we are putting our hand up to share in this ministry of caring for the needy. Ah, you say, but we don't earn our salvation simply by good works. Perhaps, but I think this passage clearly demonstrates that we don't have salvation or wholeness without them either. They are integral to our lives in the kingdom of God where Christ reigns. Good works for the benefit of others are central to the heart of the gospel and discipleship. But don't you think that we can sometimes get into that space of good works for the benefit of ourselves? Has anyone ever been caught in that trap where you do something good to make you feel better? You do something good because you want to be seen in a certain way. And sometimes doing good works can become a smoke screen that we hide behind to justify ourselves. That's a pretty confronting thought, isn't it? And I've been mulling it over about myself. If our good works are not really and truly for the benefit of others, perhaps they're not really good works. This passage challenges us to be really honest about what and who we pay attention to what and who we notice, and whether our response is for the benefit of others, for the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the one in prison, or whether our response is for the benefit of ourselves so that we feel better. In the blog on Friday, I spoke about compassion as suffering together because clearly this Christ the King, the Good Shepherd, we've just seen has, is someone with compassion at the core of their very being. And I talked about compassion, as, yes, as suffering together. That is being with someone in their situation and feeling with them, not taking on all their burdens as ours because that's unhealthy, but being with and simply allowing them to be heard and to know that they have someone alongside to love, to care, to pray. It's in coming alongside and in this way we exercise the power of love. In the blog I also wrote about the phrase watchword. I said a watchword is a word or a phrase that expresses or embodies the way that we respond in action, whether as individuals or as a group. A watchword invites us to pay attention to what and who is around us and to respond in a way that is consistent with the watchword. So it's paying attention and watching and we're about to, Advent becomes a season of paying attention and watching and waiting. I said that Christmas, for the benefit of others, is our Advent and Christmas watchword. Equally, feeding the hungry, offering the thirsty, drink, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, taking care of the sick and visiting those in prison is a watchword. It's for the benefit of others. It's a principle to guide our response as people who live in the kingdom where Christ reigns, a response to what's happening around us. It's about living in the kingdom of God where Christ, the suffering one, is king. It's about being blessed through a life of care and compassion. I have to say that I've been in churches where people were always looking out for a new revelation, for the latest word from God, for a sign and spending a lot of energy on that. I'm going to suggest that today the message is not new. It's always been the message. Eternal life awaits those who, in, who participate in the kingdom, caring for the hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, and the one in prison. God is at work in the world. The kingdom of God has come near. Christ 
is king and we are invited to respond living in this kingdom by being people of compassion paying attention and responding to those around us in need let's pray loving God for most of us we have so much and yet it doesn't mean that our lives are straightforward or easy help us to be grateful for what we have and willing to share all that we have with others that out of the challenges of our own life we can have fresh insight into the lives of others that the challenges of our own lives might grow us to be more compassionate people able to respond to those around us as we put a full stop at this point in our church year and look ahead to a new season in the next week we ask your love and your grace to guide us while you are king you are the shepherd and we place ourselves in your care to do your work for your glory in Jesus name Amen.